Do you buy vinyl? This is Steve Earle and I'm at Amoeba in Hollywood and this is what's in my bag. Angel, you can never go home. Never go home. Never go home. If you want me and I know you can never go home. In 1972, Waylon Jennings made a record called Honky Tonk Heroes, and where is it? It was uh, country acts figuring out that rock acts got to do things they didn't get to do. You know, they got to make records the way they wanted to. Oh, lovable losers and no account losers and a honky tonk hero like me. It's all songs by, written by Billy Joe Shaver, because I think they met at the Dripping Springs Reunion, which was sort of the forerunner of the Willie Nelson Fourth of July picnics. Danny Epps, a friend of mine from Houston, was actually was supposed to be playing with Billy Joe, but he was smoking a joint with me at the back of the place, and we looked up, and there was Billy Joe on stage, and it was too far for him to get up there. So. But I'm pretty sure that's why this record came about was that day, because he heard all these great songs that Billy Joe Shaver wrote. And my new record, uh, So You Want to Be an Outlaw, is sort of shamelessly and unapologetically patterned after this Waylon Jennings record. Right next to that Waylon Jennings record was this one. I was actually kind of around, got to go to some of the sessions and hang out a little bit, because I knew a couple of people that were around. It was recorded at uh, Jack's Tracks. and. Uh, Jack Clement produced it. Cowboy Jack Clement, he recorded Great Balls of Fire. He started out at Sun recording, and he was the last engineer at Sun Records. And then he came to Nashville, and by the time I got there in 1974, he had a little empire he had built up. He had a label called JMI. He put out the first Don Williams records. Then he decided to make a horror movie called Dear Dead Delilah, starring Agnes Moorhead, and the whole thing went down the toilet overnight, because movies are expensive, and it was a horrible failure. <laughs> I'm trying to remember because it was so transitional at the time. I, I don't think I ever heard this record on vinyl. I was married to an A&R person. You know, I, if I wanted to see my wife, I had to spend a lot of time in Seattle in you know, the late 80s. And you know, everybody tried to sign this band and um, she didn't, you know, she ended up leaving the label that eventually signed them, which was, she, I think it's one of the reasons we're divorced. But uh, this is groundbreaking, there's not any doubt about it, and it's kind of saved rock and roll for a minute, but it's because of the songs. He was a really great songwriter, and it's a great record. Ah. I love Sleater Kenny. I just always have, and, and I, I love this record. Somebody decides to make a grown up, fully developed record based on everything that they've done in their careers up to that point, and I wish these guys would make more records. Cool hipster TV show, notwithstanding. Put a bird on it. I was looking for the birth of the cool. It didn't exist on vinyl here today, so so I picked up. Um, it's a pretty good band. It's Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Red Garland, Paul Chambers, and Philly Joe Jones. It's like this is a really, really good record. <laughs> My taste in jazz is pretty archaic. I don't get much pets. Roland Kirk, Rip Riggin Panic. You know, after that, it starts to kind of lose me a little bit. But I do love, uh, you know, Bitches Brew is my Miles record. It's where I started and I backtracked to all this stuff from Bitches Brew because of my age. So I, I like that record quite a bit too. If I'd run into it out there on vinyl, I probably would have bought it. <laughs> Chet Baker sings on vinyl. I'm so lucky to be loving you. I love the idea that when he, he sings and he plays, and it's the same voice.
When I got out of jail in 94, <clears throat> my voice had kind of gotten a rest because I hadn't made any, any songs or, uh, but I'd also done a lot of damage to my lungs and my voice had changed. And I started recording with Ray Kennedy and the way he recorded, I discovered that I could sing soft and I could do things when I sang softer rather than loud all the time that, that were, that were kind of cool. And discovered this intimacy that you can have in vocals on records and that was a lot of that was emulating it. And even though I can't sing anywhere near that good, um, you know, using that approach to the way that, that uh, just the sheer volume they use in the proximity to the microphone, that kind of stuff. This is um, Sir Coxon. This one producer produced, um, this stuff is from 60 to 62. So this is proto, proto you know, rock steady and, and ska music. Oh, tell me why, tell me why, tell me why, tell me why. Oh, yeah. why you My introduction to reggae is a lot of it and Jamaican music in general. I mean, I heard Jamaican records and didn't know they were Jamaican records. When I heard The Israelites by Desmond Decker and the Aces, I just thought it was a weird sounding R&B record. Oh, I thought it was really cool and I loved it, but I, I just had no idea. My Boy Lollipop, I remember that record and I had no idea that was, I was listening to Jamaican music. My boy Lollipop, you made my heart go giddy up. So I was in Houston, Texas um, when I was 17 years old, just gotten out on my own. Basically followed Towns Van Zandt over there and there's a radio station that's still there, KPFT, and it's the first radio station I ever got on. And um, they did a benefit for themselves because it's listener-sponsored radio. They showed the harder they come. And I heard that music for the first time. And the harder they come, when you heard it in 1972, you were getting a history of reggae from the beginning up to that point, except it leaves out Bob Marley because it's Leslie Kong and a whole group of people that Marley had worked with early on and they got crossways and so Bob Marley is not on that record on purpose. It was all dance music. The whole concept of dance hall, you know, uh, it, and it, that had predated any of the stuff paid by live bands. The idea of sound systems, the idea of, that these guys, the, the Jamaican record business was largely based on creating music for these DJs to play on their sound systems and for them to toast over, to rap over. And then, oh, and then you start back on and study the whole history of what's the mainstream of pop music now. That's where hip hop comes from. It came to probably New York first. This is stuff that I haven't heard, maybe a track or two from this period. And there's two volumes. I'm kind of wishing I got both of them now. Can I go back and get the other one? Couldn't help it. This is uh, the Marshall Mathers LP on vinyl. So won't the real Slim Shady please stand up? Please stand up. Please stand up. This is a really genuinely great record from beginning to end that I kind of wore out. My girlfriends at the time that this record came out, kids learned how to cuss from this record. And because uh, I was always playing it when I was taking them to school. And well, from this and from me. But uh, it's a, this is a really... It's a really, really great record, and I can't wait to hear what it sounds like on vinyl. It, vinyl's become a big deal, you know, like for everybody, I think. It's the only growing part of the record industry, and, you know, independent record shops are an important part of that. We actually, I'm lucky, I travel by bus, so we sell vinyl on the road, and we can, we sell a lot of it, probably more than we do anything else, and vinyl's a big deal. We used to make records for girls, now we make them for nerds, and, and they like vinyl. That's all I got. Yeah, I'm cutting out a fire break line.